When he was born, he was ever so ugly. He was a very happy child, you know, just smiling. And when I used to sing vivacious uh, and uh, happy songs, he started and he was, you know, laughing and enjoying it. And he had a face, you know, like this. But when I started singing a lullaby, which was very sad, uh, Schubert's uh, so on, he started doing this, ne I mean, ready to cry. He had reactions for music since he was four months old. Energy, genius, and star. He had this extraordinary combination of a warm Mediterranean soul and the steely, rather mechanical Russian technique. He had a very beautiful um, sound. To hear sound of Nicholas, it's very true. It's, it has warm blood and, and meat in it. He never played two bars of, of a piece in, in the same way. He was in the music. He was one with his uh, piano. And when he was playing piano, you can see him, that he was a... Uh, uh, he was he, living then. He was, he was free. He was not in, on earth. He was a star. I've never met anybody being genius again in music. A man who could achieve anything. When Nicholas played, it was more than music. It 
he used to go to his aunt. We didn't have any piano. He was five years old. She used to live very close to our house, Ritza. And she had the piano. And she was very good at that stage to teach him, you know. One of his aunt was teaching him the piano. And at that time, Solon Mikhailidis came, our great professor, who was a professor of his mother also. They invited him home. Uh, he made him a test uh, without seeing what he was playing. He could say, tell the, the score, maybe a bar with notes. Nicolas had not seen them. He could say it's a do, a mi, or a, let's say. Then uh, the other test, uh, he, uh, with his ear, he checked him, you know, with his ear. When he heard him, he said that this child is, uh, is uh, very gifted from God. He suggested that he started lessons with George Arvanitakis, who was at yeah, the Musical Academy, I guess. I yes, know. the Greek the Academy music, of yeah. Music. And he was this, uh, the youngest uh, student that Arvanitakis had to take, him only. He didn't used to take any, but he realized he was very talented. My first memories of Nicholas. Uh, Nicholas playing the piano, um, Nicholas having to go to the piano and practice. His father was watching over him, even attending his lessons. He lost time, I mean, of playing for his age, you know. Uh, he lost this. In a way, it was a sort of a pressure, really. One of the problems of Nicola all his life was his mom and his dad that they were over him and over protecting and coming. However, he needed that. He told me that he actually he didn't have childhood life. Yeah. He didn't play with the ball, he didn't play the games with the other boys. I remember that he was the one that he could go to the concerts and um, all the... Um, my, my parents used to take him with them. I remember it because I wanted to go as well. When he was 11 years old, he won the first prize at that uh, competition, Katie's Papayano competition. He comes back. Then uh, there are serious um, Thinking about uh, Solonas spoke to us about this special school of music in Moscow. It was the only place that had school for these special children. И вот как раз здесь вот эта фотография, он приехал, но это нужно, очевидно, вот как и было в газете. Здесь было написано, что по просьбе Макариуса именно и по просьбе Акел, коммунистической партии Кипра, он был прислан сюда, зачислен в ЦМШ. Central Music School in Moscow. It was a big world which opened itself for us. Big musicians which we could hear and learn from them. <clears throat> it was a very new situation for both of us. I think this create kind of uh, uh, solidarity το σημερινό ραδιοσκόπιο ο Κλήτος Ιωαννίδης συνομιλεί με τον Νικόλα Οικονόμου. Ο καθένας είχε το δικό του δάσκαλο στο όργανο του, το οποίο ήταν και το πιο βασικό όπως ανάφερα πριν. Ε, εγώ είχα δύο δασκάλες. Ε, είχα δύο δασκάλες συγκεκριμένα. Και οι δύο δουλεύαν στο μεγάλο οδείο, το Τσεκόφσκι, αλλά διδάσκανε στο σχολείο, διότι το σχολείο αυτό είναι εξαρτώμενο, όπω είπαμε. Αλλά δεν είναι όλοι οι δασκάλοι που διδάσκαν πέρα που ήταν στο μεγάλο οδείο. Η δική μου ήταν. Και ε, δύο φορέ την εβδομάδα είχαμε μάθημα. Μέναμε δε σε ένα οικοτροφείο, το οποίο δεν ήταν μαζί με το σχολείο, ήταν 
500 μέτρα παρακάτω και στο οποίο υπήρχαν δωμάτια με πιάνα και τέτοια πράγματα. Υπήρχε μια ε, ομαδική ζωή, α πούμε, όλο το μάθημα. There were very big, two big rooms, boys on the second floor and the girls on the third floor. And we had uh, educators there. Был Николас, то поскольку он был ребенком с 11 лет, то тут, конечно, внимание должно было быть просто с, в течение всех суток, что с ним. Он живет в интернате, у него там питание, у него сон, у него физкультура, у него дисциплина такая или иная. То есть в курсе абсолютно всего, конечно. And a certain time the light would be switched off, but we, of course, wouldn't go sleep immediately. So we were telling jokes, and uh, many jokes were pretty anti-Sovietic jokes. Вы знаете, его в основном любили. Он очень легко выходил на контакт всю жизнь. Это его менталитет просто таков. Но были стычки. Вот мне недавно рассказывал ныне профессор консерватории, тогда он был его со сокурсник, одноклассник. Были стычки, были. He had a very hard time there, because he was the youngest, and he wouldn't. Um, he was coming from a West country, you know, so he's a, he was a capitalist. Uh, Once he, he, he told them to his friends that uh, the Mercedes is a much better car than Volga and they, they beat him for that. You, you should keep the rules of being there, of living there. Those rules were, uh, there were prescription from the morning till the evening how it should go. I mean, it was a big change, really, and especially the climate and the food. He didn't like it. But he, he learned very quickly, you know. He, he was speaking Russian pretty well in a very short time. Η του σχολείου είχε ενδιαφέρον διότι εφόσον μέναμε μαζί και ήταν όλη μουσική, υπήρχε μια ομαδική ζωή, αλλά η οποία δεν ήταν χωρί προβλήματα φυσικά. Γιατί όταν υπάρχουν όσοι που κάνουν το ίδιο πράγμα, πάντα υπάρχει α πούμε και ένα συναγωνισμό. Ο οποίο δεν εκφραζόταν τόσο φανερά φυσικά, διότι υπήρχε όπω λέω και η ομαδικότητα, αλλά υπήρχαν διάφορε καταστάσει. Διότι οι άνθρωποι που ερχόντουσαν ήταν διαφόρων προελεύσεων. Δηλαδή, ο ένα ερχόταν από χωριό, ο άλλο από πόλη, ο άλλο από άλλη δημοκρατία τη Σοβιετική Ένωση κτλ. Of course, here, there he was the bad boy, taking jeans and some tapes. The Russians knew already about the Beatles. They knew that they existed and they knew their songs, but it wasn't allowed to, to, to buy their discs or having them or listening to them. He was playing it immediately and changing it, saying I would do here this and this, I would maybe would be better this and this. And then uh, when he was uh, 16, um, less than 16 years old, he, Rima Hananina, the assistant of Emilianova, the big professor, wanted him to, to go in. They had few months to prepare to go for this uh, big uh, Tchaikovsky competition, which is uh, in those days happen every four years. Какую-то серьезную задачу, на которую он бы клюнул, и таким образом <laughs> через год, в 70-м году, должен был быть конкурс Чайковского. Я говорю, Николас, а что если нам с тобой программу конкурс Чайковского сделать, помимо того, что мы по программе должны проходить в школе? Как, а я могу? Так а в чем дело? Надо стараться, только и всего. И эту идею 
он воспринял. They decided very late that he would participate. So they started practicing only a few months before the competition. But uh, and they, they worked very intensive and he, he managed. А ведь вот вот он блеснул как искорка. Но когда сообщали э, уже результаты, мы были вместе с Ниной Петровной в малом зале и слушали, когда значит, произносили тех, кого пропустили на второй тур. И когда там не оказалось ни голоса, Нина Петровна сделала такой жест. Там есть такая бархатная балюстрадочка, мы стояли около нее, она взяла так руку, Зарезали. My father was there again, <laughs> and uh, when they he, when they threw him out, uh, a judge of the jury was uh, very upset. And his teacher found out that uh, the reason they threw him out is because if they wouldn't at the first round, they couldn't throw him out after the second round. He was too good. The main problem is that at this competition that time would be decided who would take prize long before it was told. I mean, at least approximately. And this is when I remember him saying, I'm not a um, racing horse and I don't want to do that again, ever. And then after the Tchaikovsky competition, because he was so good, they accepted him uh, instead of... Uh, all the others were 18 years old, he was 16. He was accepted in the conservatory. The good thing about being in Tchaikovsky, Nicholas was not listening himself and only playing the piano. He could go to the classes where they play the violin, where they play the trombone, where they put, I mean, the strings, the, the percussions, everything. That's why he was so completed and he knew everything about music. It was the best school in the world, you know. It was after Stalin that it was during the Khrushchev. It was a little bit liberated, the whole thing, but still he felt oppressed. He was a very critical person. As a matter of fact, he left Russia because he couldn't stand it anymore, this Stalinistic time there, you know. He always used to write, uh, I'm going crazy here, you know. He was such an independent mind such an independent bird. If you told him to stay in a cage, that was death for him. And the school needed and uh, patience and discipline that Nicholas never had. No patience, no discipline. He came to the point that he said, okay, I'm leaving. But I remember him the argument to my father, he, it was always, I can do it on my own. I know. I don't need them anymore, so I'm leaving. You know, life goes on. It turns around. And when, of course, there was no longer any news from him, it was very painful. Very painful. So he went to Germany because we had uh, some friends, English couple, an English couple. He stayed with them. Um, they were interested about culture and music. That's how through them he met Mike Reynolds. In those days, Mike Reynolds was the cultural attaché. I first heard about Nicholas from some friends of the family. And in 1971, these friends, talking to us at a party, 
said he was desperate to practice his piano. He was uh, cheerful, uh, immensely likable straight away, very vivid sense of fun. We had small children at that stage. They called him our resident hippie. Um, and we just got to know Nicholas as a person who brought fun, humor, um, but a lot of passionate music making into the household. I suggested to Nicholas that one thing that he needed was not just to practice on our piano every day, but to start giving concerts to people. So I said to Nicholas, I would be prepared to put on a private concert for him, and I would invite 50 or so movers and shakers who lived and worked in Dusseldorf. And everybody crowded into our music room, filled the hall and the drawing room, and Nicholas sat down and played Mussorgsky, played pictures at an exhibition. At the end of that recital, I think there were 50 true lifelong fans of Nicholas as a potentially great musician. He gave an absolutely stunning performance of the piece and he judged it to perfection. This emboldened me sufficiently to start ringing up some commercial promoters. Quite quickly, a Cologne concert agency said they would be prepared to give Nicholas an evening recital. And we had a full house for his first proper recital in Germany. And that concert was a colossal critical and public success. Hello. From Düsseldorf we came to Rome just for, for a few days, yeah. and I was sitting beside Nicholas, <laughs> and he was uh, all the all the time telling me bad Russian jokes. Yeah, yeah. But uh, somebody mentioned next day there would be a small concert by this man with, his, with the dirty jokes. And I asked, which is not my normal uh, behavior, asked if I could be present at the time. Yeah. Uh, and, and I invited myself. Yeah. And this yeah. uh, invitation of myself uh, changed my whole life. This is how it, it's, the whole thing started with Munich. They told him that Munich over Elma, his, he met his friends, Elma friends, and they told him that um, the best city in Germany to start a career is not Dusseldorf, it's Munich, because that was the center then. Elma was always around from the very beginning, and I remember that the, his first concert was a big cultural event in Munich. There was only one thing to do to, to make this known to the public, uh, is to create a, a kind of myth, the kind of legend. Mm -hmm. yeah. The first concert in the uh, Hercules Saal in Munich yeah. was sold out mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> by pure uh, one telling the other. Did you hear? <laughs> well, there was uh, much uh, rumor and much uh, uh, high expectations on this concert.
people loved what he played and he was sympathetic and people were fascinated by him. Once uh, there came a, a, a quite a famous music critic here to us to somehow, I don't know, he wanted to fetch something which I don't mm -hmm. remember. And then he said, um, I don't know, there's something about Nicolas Economou. Um, there must be a kind of connection and um, I don't know who this is uh, and who is working so much for him, but he's much more known than anybody else. Yes, yes. <laughs> <laughs> and then we laughed very much. We didn't tell him that he was really in the center of the spider net because <laughs> it was all around uh, yeah, yeah. our house. And oh, he said out. also, um, it, it seems to me something like a, a Munich mafia. Yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. For yeah, Nicholas yeah. Economo, he is not the... the it the, was. Yeah. <laughs> but he was yeah. in, in, in yeah. a kind of center of it. So yeah. He yeah. stood here, here in the kitchen and, yeah. and we said nothing and said, OK, yeah, yeah, you're yeah. here in the, in the center yeah. of the mafia. Was in Hello. Padrino, yeah, yeah. the Godfather. <laughs> yeah, Godfather was you. <laughs> yeah. Ton ab. Nicolas Economou, 3, die erste. Meine Damen und Herren, Nick Economo, ein Mann, das Fußball spielt und auch ein bisschen Zeit für Klavier findet. Was meinen Sie, Herr Economo, wenn Sie diese unglaublichen Minuten zu uns geben, dieses unwahrscheinlich, diese unmenschliche Fußball, das Sie spielen? Hat das etwas zu tun mit, mit der Musik? Und wie sehen Sie die, die äh, Auskunft, Zukunft äh, von äh, äh, unserem Leben mit, mit äh, Fußball? Werden alle Leute Fußball spielen oder es werden nur für privilegierte äh, Leute ein, ein, ein Alle werden Fußball spielen. Um, jetzt verstehen wir alles. <lacht> ja, das ist ein das. sozialer Mensch, ein Musiker, ein Fußballspieler. Nick Economo. Guten Abend, meine Damen und Herren. Sie sehen jetzt die Sendung Klavier als Sport, in dem wir Ihnen zeigen den schnellen Pianisten und er wird spielen den Minutenwalzer von Chopin in weniger als eine Minute. Wir wünschen Ihnen gute Unterhaltung. Time is money. When he announced to me that he got married, I said, Bravo, well done, Nicholas. I'm very pleased. Congratulations, because he had somebody to be with him. My father was shocked again. <laughs> and but my mother was really happy about it. Nicholas was very independent. He wouldn't like to live on the expense of my parents or anything. So he knew that he had to make a living. And so he met uh, Ralph Siegel. He was, um, he's very known in Germany, producer. And he offered him a job writing songs for him. So I remember he was uh, earning 1,000 marks per month for writing songs. Nicholas, on an interview, he said he had written, I mean, the lyrics and the song, about 600 uh, songs. 
and he was paying uh, each month, uh, and that's how they could go through the early years when he got married, in, after he had gone in 1972 in Munich. And he had already, in uh, 1976, uh, he had already he, Semeli, his daughter. This is them when they got married, and my mother was pregnant with me. It looks kind of like a shot from a love story with this kind of Kodak feel to it. Different that, but a good that. He was playing a lot of music for Semeli. He was singing with her, he was talking to her, you know, he was a... Um, because he was home, at home. As, a, as an artist, you don't go to work. Um, yeah, in general, he was a good dad. You know, we loved each other a lot. Kind of... In a way, we were kind of like in love with each other. I think. He loved his daughter. I can say it, I saw it many, many years. really the, the, the emotional center and I mean also the pragmatic center of his life. I mean he wasn't particularly proactive taking me to museums or anything like that. Like, I remember sometimes I was really bored and he said do you want to go out? Should we go for a walk? And I would get really excited <laughs> and then he'd take me to electronic shops <laughs> and look at you know music equipment or like cameras and stuff and I was so bored out of my mind. <laughs> The sound of music was in the house throughout, you know, the night, really. He lived a fairly bohemian lifestyle. Uh, if it was fun to play the piano until three o'clock in the morning and to finish up by doing jazz improvisations, then Nicholas would do it. And then there were times where we'd improvise together and the thing about my dad is that he liked to play. He was a very playful kind of character. He would also play this game where he would play different composers and I would have to guess who they are, just to train my ear. He was a good father. He was a good, I think he was a good father. He was not easy, <laughs> but what does word easy has to do with being good or, or less good, you know? He wasn't not easy, good father. Nicholas, when he managed to come to Cyprus through a ship, he said, I met Elmar's son. He said, like an ancient god. And Elmar, who was then the, the second uh, director of the cultural department of Munich, had a, a, quite a, a strong influence on, on the media and all the things in his uh, function. Your role in, in Munich when Nicholas uh, arrived, you really went around to all friends you had, also came to us to say there's really an incredible person who arrived in Munich. Nobody knows him, but I say to you, he's the greatest. And yes. so. They were attracted and they became one. And that was a big help to, for Nicholas to start. He was really very lucky. When I got to know him, he played some concerts, and uh, when we started always successful. People were loved his playing. Uh, he didn't play very often, but uh, I would say once a month. And then the uh, piano summer came up in 1981. It was his idea with Manfred Frey 
but they started it. And the true Nicholas that Martha could go there and play, Chick Corea would go there and play. He got a big concert with Chick Corea, was, was packed in the, in the biggest uh, venue of Munich then, Congress Halle. I would say nearly 2,000 people. I remember we, she, Marta was playing in uh, Hercules. <laughs> we went because he wanted to meet Marta. I think we, my memory is not very well, but I think we went backstage. This is what he used to do always. So if he wanted to meet somebody, he was just going there and meeting them. I mean, um, and of course, because of his personality, everybody was. Impressed. And so they met, and uh, uh, Nicholas. Uh, uh, it was the fulfillment of, of one of his this, uh, wishes, of his desires, of his dreams to meet the great Martha Archeretsche. Martha, my dear, you have always been my inspiration. Please be good to me, Martha, my love. Martha, my dear. Martha, my dear. Great singing, yeah? Yeah, go Fantastic. on, it's very nice. May I want to sing it? You, you must see, sing. I came just when you were starting this. They were very good friends. Yeah. Tonight, I think it's a nice song. Singing girl, yeah. He was um, admiring her and uh, he was a very good friend with her. Then the good times came, yeah, 81, 82, 83. Then we made a tour, for instance, with Marta Agerich. We went through the biggest halls in, in Germany, 10 concerts, and I was the one to organize that. And was not, not, what was not uh, complicated because Marta was already world famous. She was a, num she was a very, very famous uh, lady. And he became uh, more and more famous uh, with her by her side, I mean, and also in, in, in the festival concerts and then in the TV, in the broadcastings of our films. One of his superb recordings with Marta Argerich is of the Nutcracker Suite for four hands on the piano. And Nicholas once told me that he had not lost a single note from Tchaikovsky's full orchestral score. Every note is in his two piano arrangement of the Nutcracker. 
they were playing together, but they were as they were the same at the same time very good friends. And if you see these photos of Martha and Tim, you see that there was a really strong relation. Mm. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. And she loved him very much, and and. Uh, uh, and he or her, so yeah. it was a very strange thing. He yeah. didn't know what, what it was. I mean, yeah, it was materialized it? in this nutcrackers uh, yeah. Yeah, uh, yeah, sweet, sweet, sweet yeah. Yeah. which you arranged. Yes, yes. Uh, mm. And they was uh, only a few perfect rehearsals. Yeah. They did it perfectly. She was very important for her. Mm -hmm. And once she told me that for, uh, for her, he was one of the most important pianists she ever met. Really? Yeah, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. really. They, they, they needed. Each other. And then in the film, of course, you know he he, he sang Martha, my dear, you know, <laughs> this Beatles song, no? mm -hmm. uh, my inspiration. <laughs> made the uh, recordings. The first recording was with duet with Chikoria. The second recording was a duet with Marta Agerich. The third uh, recording was a, a solo uh, CD with a picture of a, a, an exhibition with the Deutsche Grammophon, the number one label in the world, the yellow label. So Nicholas was in the very best condition to make a real career. the many friends he made uh, in and around Munich, he was introduced to the German film director Margareta von Trotter. We went together in a restaurant and by chance he, he sat beside me. He didn't know me, I didn't know him. So we started to speak together and he uh, told me what he said, that thought or did or were and I was uh, also telling him my little story. I, and since then I only did two films as a director so he couldn't know me and I didn't never hear of him. And when he said he's also a composer, I like out of, a, of nothing. I never heard a note of him, but I said, you will do the next music for my next film. And so we laughed and I laughed and that was it. He met Margarete von Trotta. I played also, he especially wrote music with solo for clarinet, so I played it, uh, we recorded it. Uh, working with Nico 
for us was very special because it was the first time for him. So he had not yet a method or a strategy or he was very insecure. He was very talented, but very insecure. And so he wanted me all the time beneath him. So I had to come every night or every evening to his house, to his apartment and we spoke and he, he played me the music on the, on the piano. He had this need of help and of security all the time. But it was marvelous because then uh, I already was in his apartment and there were coming always other friends of Moscow or other composers or other instrumentalists and it, it ended always in a big concert, in a big wine party and it was always fun. I like very much his compositions. There were wonderful things. For the Blei on the Zeit, was it not? Yes, he did yes. it. It's really good music yes, he made. Yeah, and it's wonderful he did. Uh, they're so terrible uh, film music normally, uh, also uh, in these times. But uh, this was very great. We did three films, Blind Zeit, uh, Sheer Madness and, and Rosa Luxemburg. And for Rosa Luxemburg he did a really big with big orchestra, a real work, full work. I think his film music is absolutely wonderful and I think he did a superb job on creating the right sort of musical ambiance for the films that were being made. I think he might have had a career as a film composer and arranger. If he would have uh, 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 made a decision to be a composer, it would have been enough for his own life, but he did not. Yeah. He was the writer, the composer, the pianist, uh, uh, the, uh, the, the filmmaker, the, he, uh, the, the, the uh, politician, he wanted to become uh, president of Cyprus. <laughs> he wasn't a film composer. He didn't see himself in this, but the moment he did it, it was quality, because he couldn't do it otherwise. I will just say that the composing for me is very important, but I compose very little. I try to make some music that dass die Musiker die, die Möglichkeit gibt, sich zu ausdrücken. Ausdrücken, ja. Und ich bin ehrlich, wenn ich die Musik, dass ich, ich höre, meinen Kopf wiedergebe. Das ist alles, was ich tun kann. Ne? Und man kann nicht sich entscheiden, jetzt eine große Musik machen oder sowas. Ne? Wenn man so denkt, dann schafft, schafft man nichts. Composition was very important for him because it was the the, uh, the soul of his inter interpreting it. Uh, but he, he would never uh, say, "I am a composer." Uh, uh, no, no, I never. He, uh, he addressed him not, uh, as a musician, but not as a composer as such. And the tower. Uh, <laughs> no, he made enough compositions. Yes. The tower was an idea that Nicholas had. It has a strong narrative story. There is a couple. A couple meet, a couple spend happy times together, a couple has a child, a couple drift apart. And willy-nilly, I got drawn in as his collaborator on this project. Working with Nicholas was unadulterated joy because of his own pleasure in what we were creating together. It started in 1972, in our Dusseldorf days, and we were still writing or tweaking some of the songs in 1992.
we first of all moved back to England. Uh, Nicholas was a regular visitor to see us. Um, he would come and stay. Uh, we would talk about music, make a bit of music, work on the tower for a bit maybe, for a week at a time, and then he would return to Germany. summer came 1982 he got a he got a, a he was in three concerts or four concerts included in the biggest rooms in Munich every uh, concert was packed big critics festival of the Giants Nicholas included Gulda Agerich Korea Mekoitaina, Nicolas Economo, so big headlines. He was well paid by us. He played on the best pianos and he got big critics. So it was, uh, it was a really challenging start. It's one of, of the best pieces in, in the history of music is when uh, Chick Corea, uh, Friedrich Gulder and Nicolas Economo play together. All the, 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 the glances, they change. It's fabulous. It be, it's uh, also famous. It is called The Meeting. Sri yeah? Chines <laughs> Meet. So he's a really um, a good piano player, a great musician, and uh, maybe a genius. <laughs> performances of German romantic music, especially uh, 
Robert Schumann war der Otto äh, Franz Liszt. In, in, the private, in, in the private rooms, uh, uh, this uh, were great, great uh, um, um, events, uh, mm. not only for me, though, uh, it, I think, uh, uh, like in these moments, uh, you, you have, you, you have, uh, you, you were, 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 well, it, were, it was, it were divine moments, yeah. the yeah. best I have ever experienced in music, really, mm -hmm. yeah. but all, yeah. only in, a, in a, this private circle. Uh, yeah. uh, uh, yeah. These performances were magic. Yeah. Mm. Listening to to Nicolas Chrysleriana, I can listen this work with any other pianist <laughs> personally. From the critics and for people that are still alive, like Martha Argerich and so on, they say that for Chrysleriana, nobody, nobody can interpret, even here, like uh, Nicholas. Every note sits there where it should sit and how it should sit. And Nicholas understood the meaning of of pausa. Chris Lerian is my little picture. I think that is the school. The ganze Schumann is dream. The fantasia is the problem also, with form and so. Hmm? Mm. But you said, Ivan, when did you start to sing? Chris Lerian? Yeah. With 90? Yeah. Vor zehn Jahren. Und immer findest du neue Sachen dann, ne? Immer. Ja, ich weiß, es gibt unglaublich viele Geschichten und so. Immer. Ja. Aber es war so eine Identifikationssache für mich. Mhm. Weil ich war in, in, in Deutschland und äh, ich bin von einer anderen Welt gekommen. Und, äh, und dann dieses Stück ist, war für mich gut, weil das, ist eine, das war eine Unterstützung für mich, weißt du, eine Bestätigung, weil das ist eine, so ein großes Stück von Kunst. Und, man beschäftigt, beschäftigt sich damit und dann man hat diese Kraft irgendwie die weißt du was ich meine mm. one time when we sat in this room I, I remember there was mm -hmm. after one of these uh, Klavier uh, Sommer, Sommer. Mm -hmm. and the Marta Munich Marta Arnrich was here and, and also mm -hmm. Chikorea and we spoke <laughs> about Chrysleriana mm -hmm. and Nicholas made this this uh, problem of the, the artist who never comes really in contact with the public and is destroyed by the public uh, more or less um, and, and stays alone and has this inner feeling you, you said. And we spoke about and, and then Chikorea, a uh, good friend of Nicholas also said, but I don't know where is your problem, she said. <laughs> hey, you're, I make and the whole public <laughs> will do the same thing and we are staying in contact. Uh, no, this uh, uh, this uh, uh, motive of Kreisler Jana, uh, mm -hmm. the, the last uh, mm -hmm. uh, few uh, uh, sounds, uh, was really his life motive. But I would like to talk about Maritza a little bit because his wife. Yeah. Yes, his wife. Because when the, when they came here <coughs> together first. I think she was such a sweet person and she really devoted her life to him. The problems came up when she lost twins. They were having twins, but Maritza lost the baby. So I think that was the moment that Nicolas, um, the, the relationship, I don't know how, how what happened or how it happened, but it, uh, things changed. And this was also, uh, there were some signs who started to, mm. uh, perhaps also this fact had, had uh, done something uh, difficult in, uh, in, in, their this, relationship. in their relationship. But I yeah. think it's more than that um, all these ladies. Mm, yeah, Ma 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 Maya, <laughs> Maya Hoffman. <laughs> yeah, of course, yeah. yeah. She was a f fascinating person. He was very much in love. And that was the reason they the marriage went, was over. Well, when I met Maya, I liked her immediately. 
mean, don't forget, my father had affairs. You know, it's not like all of a sudden there's this new woman. You know. It was a f fascinating person, mm. but uh, the bad thing was that uh, he followed uh, her. Mm. Uh, uh, he went away yes. from 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 Munich. She would be good for him. They, were, they had many things in common, intellectually, and you know, and she was, you know, stunningly beautiful and interesting. Alles, was den Stalin betrifft, den Lenin und den Trotzki, kann ich Ihnen erklären, aber Ihre Kassette ist zu kurz. Nicholas would have been a fabulous figure playing his piano in 1918-1919 at the heart of the Bolshevik Revolution. He really could have talked ideas, as it were, with Lenin, with Trotsky, with all the people who were espousing the new world that was to come. He was a very left person. He was, he was a communist, that's what he said about himself. Without being in any party, <laughs> that's not what he meant with being a communist. <clears throat> Loving him so much, and I think he liked me also very much, but sometimes we were killing each other three times a day talking about politics. He said, it's better to be a communist out of Soviet Union than to be in Soviet Union and don't feel nice being a communist. <laughs> My father was an idealist, really. So, and a philosopher, I think. Um, And I think everything has its context. So at the time, you know, politics fitted that context. Nicholas suggested that communism had all sorts of good points in those days. I suggested that communism had more bad points than good. He never used to belong to a party, huh? first of all, never. He was left, he was a real communist dialectic, but never big to a party. Every good thing was on the left side for him. Art, people, work, creation, fun, all the good things were on the left side. He was an angry young man, ready to, to fight for openness of the society, for social ideas, for modern arts which would support these processes. My father um, wanted to bring talented people together and make art part of, of people's everyday life, not an exclusive thing that, um, you know, is for certain people. he cares, he never talks about himself, is that he likes that culture 
and especially talking about music, would come to the everyday man, people, I mean, working people. I think he became, I don't know if he became more ambitious or more frustrated with his work or more inspired, I don't really know exactly what it was, but um, I think he wanted more from his life than he had. The general kind of gist of it was that, uh, that he wasn't where he wanted to be in his career. He wanted to make a very big career then playing not only with Chick or Marta or Gulda, then I'm playing on his own in the biggest rooms of, of, the, of the country. And this was not so easy, even with these successes, even with good critics, very good critics, even with some very good concerts in Munich and other places, but a really big career was not, was not so easy and he wanted it subito, immediately, and he was not patient in, at all, he was not patient at all. I think he found it difficult to adapt to the fact that there are many more political games involved and it's not just enough to be good, you have to play the game. For Nicholas it was very important to have somebody on his side. And that was maybe the reason that he wasn't happy, because he couldn't have Maya. Why not? Because the relation was very difficult. The relationship was very difficult. He uh, hoped to come up with her help and with her love, and uh, she helped him with money, and, and she was very generous. But uh, it needed some time, and they had such struggles, such strong, heavy uh, 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 discussions, more than discussions, I, I have not the right word for that, really battles. He didn't get the record deals that he wanted. Um, that was his biggest like, disappointment, I think. He was drinking a lot, trying to find ways, new ways. He perhaps became a little bit introspective. Uh, he drank more than he should have drunk. Um, I think that happens to lots of people. Do you want me to get crazy or to get cancer? That was his answer. That's why he was drinking, to get out of the reality maybe, I don't know. But he would remember he was not really drunk. Uh... I think he was unhappy, so therefore he would kind of um, blame people or provoke them. I tried to, to go on what I prefer, uh, did for him and I arranged concerts, but they were terrible concerts. He was very tired, 
because um, everybody was expecting from him. I mean, for somebody not knowing him, it was very good. But for us, who could compare with all his uh, full personality, uh, it was very bad. I, I think uh, one problem was that he uh, n never practiced uh, uh, and he, he, he didn't uh, look for new pieces to, to, uh, to, to open his, his horizon, yeah. or, horizon. Uh, horizon. It was not longer possible to, to plan projects together. We started from time to time to discuss about new projects, concerts, compositions, whatever, but everything failed. I think sometimes uh, he had, um, and the, especially in the last uh, years of his life, and also before, he had no real clear relation or artistic relation to the dark side of his life or of life. No, no he, he didn't want to think about uh, the, the power of death. Yeah. And so it was something like a demon. He couldn't speak with it. came to Cyprus. Uh, he wanted to make this center for arts and science. The, the day before his death, he went in, in uh, Nicosia. He went to see a house where he wanted to, uh, to found mm -hmm. uh, a European uh, cultural center. Really? Uh, to, uh, to, to help the Cyprus problem. Yeah. Yeah. We used to talk and he say, I'm, I'm, I, he was in bed and I was sitting next to him and we were talking and he was telling me that um, that's, he has enough, he doesn't want to leave anymore, he's tired. And then I told him, what are you talking about? Yesterday we were talking about having this center and you still have, want to make have so many plans, I want to do so many things and change so many things. And then he turned to me and he said, yes, you're right, it's true. When he went to Cyprus in the beginning of December to his family and Imasol, uh, he was in a quite good mood and I had the feeling, oh, maybe that he's, uh, that, 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 a change could come. He was he, he was really in a good mood, and and he was he was looking forward and said, "Yeah, I will make a concert there." What he loved, people liked it. I had the feeling, oh, something goes up. This is, this seems to be a turn. This was really my thinking.
his last concert in, in Cyprus was uh, uh, in this uh, public in this uh, theater, mm -hmm. yeah. and the, the television was recording it. performing last things. He knew that he was dying. I, I don't say that he committed suicide, no, it was an accident. But uh, in a way he knew that he, it, was, it was over. couple of months before he died, I looked at him and I asked him, I said, do you, um, how did I put this question? I said, do you, re do you regret um, do you have regret in your life? And do you think that life is hopeless? And he said, yeah. Yeah, actually, this photo is always with me. Sometime before we were played in, in festival in Venice. We played Schumann, pieces of Schumann, and it was unforgettable. It was not, I felt it was so good, it was not music anymore. Something, something happened there. I believe I felt that I'm losing him. In a telephone call we had had with Nicholas very shortly before his death, he was almost saying goodbye to us. He was talking to us about the friendship we had had, how much he loved us both, how he hoped 
that various things would still happen in our lives. We thought perhaps he was being slightly over-emotional. We thought perhaps he'd had a very good evening with friends and he was ringing to tell us that he loved us. No, he was not always happy. As every human being, I think. This was the end. Marina, Marina, Yatina, Prebina, Soto, Marina, Marina, Hopla, Ilica, Se Agapo. I said, why don't you sit down and write? And you go all day, he was coming from Limassol, running around to different cafes, to different people, to uh, lunch here, dinner there, and uh, out, and girls, and why don't you sit down and write? I wrote everything I wanted, he says. It was a rainy night, a stormy night, it was a dark night. Uh, Nicolas was in Nicosia with some uh, friends from the theater. And then at the end, I think he was in a pub, he always used to go, and then he decided to come back. At the beginning he wanted to stay, and then he decided that he wanted to come back home. And he started driving. He had the audio tapes as usually, he used to smoke, I don't know. If he tried to smoke a cigarette, to get a cigarette, or to put a tape. It was a very bended, a very big curve. And, and he flew out of the road. And actually, I sort of woke up and sat up on my bed, actually, precisely the time when he, when he died. Somebody rings to me very early in the morning. I answer the phone. They found Nicolas' car in Kofinu, but they can't find Nicolas. And I thought, oh, what is he doing now again? He didn't say that it was an accident. He was asking me about a car. And uh, I never thought, uh, I thought maybe Nicolas stopped somewhere. And the other one was, um, wasn't saying clearly what it was. So I, I, told, I remember telling my mom, ask her if he's alive. And then she asked, and then she said, I'm sorry. I woke up the next morning, I could hear some phone calls and people crying, and I kind of knew he was dead. And I was screaming and shouting. Uh, when the telephone call came from the Larnaca Morgue, you can fetch the body now, they froze. Everybody. Monica tried to make him look, uh, you know, his face not to look, uh, how I would say, because of the accident, to look good looking like uh, he used to be and so on. And I had to clean him, and dress him. And she was there. I was talking to him. Now you don't feel any pain, darling. Don't worry, we are all here. For me, he was always young. I never, he will never uh, change into an old man. His uh, image is always of a, a young man with plenty of hair, rich hair, curly, playing the piano. <laughs> it's whenever I I hear the piano I I 
I think he is playing the piano. Του παπά του, αν καμιά φορά με χάνω, με θάψε τη στην κίση. Δηλαδή, του ένα σε θάψε με δεμή, ο ξένα μα θάψε. Δηλαδή, του ύστερα που έτυχε το ατύχημα, έκαμε την επιθυμία. Ύστερα ο Γιώργο, δηλαδή, με θάψε τη ζημιά στην κίση. 